We are going to be studying through uh, this psalm. This is a psalm, again, that I've been meditating on this week um, as, as a part of our reading plan. If, if you've been tracking with us through reading through the psalms, this psalm, psalm was a part of that this week. And um, it is actually at the beginning of what we know as book two of the psalm. So it was the first psalm that you read Monday morning, if, if you're tracking with our reading plan throughout the psalms. But uh, the psalms are divided into five books. This, this forms the beginning of book two of the psalms. Um, the way that I want to study it is, is first of all, um, just, just thinking about how, how it applies to us. Um, really, this psalm, it was written from a state of what I would call uh, discouragement and uh, pretty intense depression, okay? If, if you've ever been discouraged or clinically depressed, which I know some of us ha have been there, um, you'll see that, that that's all over the place in this psalm. And, and the psalms were written to give instruction to us, not only to our mind, not only to our heart, but how we are to respond. And so how, how do we respond when we're discouraged and when we're depressed? I think that's the question that we need to answer today as we look at this text. Um, if, you, if you look at it, there, there's some things that the psalmist is facing. He's facing anxiety. He's facing discontentment. He's facing hopelessness, sadness, agitation, excessive crying, a loss of appetite, restlessness, all these things. If you actually look up depression in Google, you'll see that is the definition of depression. So this man is depressed. The writer of it is depressed. Somebody's phone is ringing. And uh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Somebody's trying to get a hold of somebody. But hey, we are, we are looking at this psalm because it, these psalms have a way of speaking into our life, don't they? And today it's speaking to, into our life of when we're discouraged. When we're discouraged, how do we respond? When we're down, who do we look to? What do we do? I think the psalm is going to give us some, some answers to that today. And I, I've got some notes in your bulletin that, that you can pull out, that you can follow along with it today. Um, but I want to just begin by, by looking at who wrote this psalm, okay? Who wrote this psalm? It says that, that this psalm, if, if you have that title in your Bible, it was written um, to the choir master, a masquil, of the sons of Korah. Okay, so we have no idea what that means. Um, let me try and flesh it out as best as I can. Okay, first of all, it's a mesquil. Okay, this is a word that's not actually translated, or maybe, maybe it is translated in your Bible. Um, I, I don't know, but most Bibles don't translate this word. It would be right at the heading, under, right beside Psalm 42. It's a mesquil. And um, the, the word mesquil comes from a Hebrew verb. It means to instruct or to make someone wise, okay? And so we have this idea that the psalm could be written for the sake of instructing us, or, or it, was, it, was, it was a psalm that was to impart wisdom to us. And it kind of goes along with the way that I opened this series, that the psalms were written uh, about God, about man, about life, to, to instruct us about God, about man, and about life. Okay, you remember that. And so, so this goes right along with what we said about the Psalms, is this was written to give us instruction. We're to delight in this instruction. We're to listen to it, obey it, learn from it, okay? So, so, so that's the one thing that, that I wanted to point out. The second thing is it's written by the sons of Korah. Okay, who are the sons of Korah? Um, well, you wouldn't know this unless you, you kind of read through the Old Testament. In, in 2 Chronicles, what we see is that the sons of Korah were men that were Levites that were put in charge of temple worship. Okay, so they led the, the, the people of Israel in musical worship. That was their position. Um, and so um, if, you, if you look in 2 Chronicles 20, 19, it, it says this, the, the Korites, they stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So obviously they led people in worshiping God. That was their position, okay? And so it's given then to the choir master. Obviously this was sung publicly. And that, that's what we've been trying to do with the Psalms too, as we've been not only reading them, they were meant to be sung. Um, what, what it goes along with is what, what I explained at the beginning, that the, psalm, the Psalms are songs and they're poems, 
Okay, and so they're they're to be they're to be used in that way as poems, as songs, to not only instruct our head but instruct our heart. That's what songs do. They they get at our heart. They pull at our emotions. Okay, so so we need to read it that way. Um, the the third thing that that we had said about the Psalms was that they are inspired by God. Jesus Himself said that the Psalms are inspired. So let's remember that as we read Psalm forty two. What we want to what we want to get into today is is the way I introduced it. The psalm talks about feelings of discouragement and depression, right? And um, as with other psalms, I've crafted a sentence that I believe goes along with the psalm, kind of kind of just lays out in a clear way what the psalm is trying to communicate to us. I'm going to have Matthew just just bring it up here. It's it's this: while there are some valid reasons. For discouragement, there are many more reasons for hope. That's what I believe the psalmist is communicating here. There are really valid reasons for discouragement, for, for, for being down. But I need not dwell on them because there are many more reasons for hope. If you have your notes, we're going to be going through those. Let's see his reasons for discouragement. Okay, let, let's go through theirs. Th- through them, I have four D's, which, which may be easy to remember. Um, I, as I was reading through them, the, these words were just popping out to me as I read through this psalm. Let's, let's look at verses 1 and 2. First reason for his discouragement was desperation. Desperation. Verses 1 and 2 say, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So the psalmist, he, he's, he's comparing his, his need to, to that of a deer who, who maybe has been running or fleeing from, from someone. Um, and and he, he's thirsty. Okay, he, he needs a flowing stream of water. He, he's panting. He, 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 you get this idea of a thirst, a necessity. I'm panting. I'm thirsty for God. I'm dry. I need you, God. A longing. For an absolute necessity. That that is what he's saying. So there's desperation here. Second, he's feeling distance. Let's move on to to the second part of verse 2. It says, when shall I come? He's asking a question. When shall I come and appear before God? So he's feeling this distance from God, from his people. And this has led him to his point of spiritual depression. He's desperate. He's feeling distance. Uh, physically, as, we, as we're going to see, he's, he's far away from, from the place of worship, from the tabernacle, from the temple. And that's gotten him down. Okay? So there's desperation. There's distance. Third, there is depression. Depression. Okay, we talked about that. Characteristics of, of depression. Okay? He's got sorrow. He's got sadness. He's got crying. A lack of appetite. He's an emotional basket case. Read what it says. Verse 3. He says, my tears have been my food day and night. Has anybody ever experienced that before? I think some of us have, right? And and you don't have to be a woman to have experienced that. Okay, guys, we cry too. Um, Where where we have points in our life where, where it's just... Our emotions are raw, where we could, we could walk into the kitchen and, you know, bump, bump a glass on the table and, and we start crying about that, about, about just simple, just, just trivial things. We start crying about them and it's a sign of depression. It really is. Grief, sorrow, okay? Uh, the, the lack of appetite we see here as well. He says, my tears have been my food. Obviously, he's not eating. He's just crying, okay? That's another sign of, of depression, discouragement. I think we've been there too, guys. Some of us have been there. Some of us struggle with this even to the point where we've been medically diagnosed as depressed and we're taking medication for that. That's where this guy is, okay? He needs help. He's longing for relief. And to make matters worse, not only is he desperate, not only is he feeling distance from God, not only is he depressed, but he's facing derision. Derision is, is kind of a, a, a word that we don't use too often. But basically, what it, what it means is, is people are getting at him. Pe- people are, are cutting him down. 
And here's what it says, verse 3, second part of verse 3. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Where is your God? So not only is he feeling distance from God, people are accusing him and saying, where is he? This God that you trust in, where is he when you need him? You're depressed, you're discouraged, you're thirsty for him, and yet he doesn't seem to be near. Now, one thing we need to get straight is, is his foes aren't denying that there is a God, because that didn't come about till later. Uh, it would probably be fellow Israelites or, or other, other people that were just telling him, hey, where is your God now when you're in trouble? I thought you were close to him. I thought he was near. Has, has God abandoned you? And, and so they're taunting him. It's like a taunt. And, and we also see that in verse 10. We see that taunt again where, where he, he, he goes back to it. And he says the, these words are wounding him. Like, like, like they're deadly. His adversaries are, are taunting him. That's what verse 10 says. They're saying, where is your God? Where is he now? Okay. And so I guess the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. To, to just pull it back into perspective for ourselves is, is when we face moments like this, which I think we've all been there at one point or another to one extreme or, or you know, may, maybe in small ways, is how do we respond? How do we respond when we're depressed, when we're down, when we're discouraged? And I believe that the Psalms were written to instruct us in this way. How we are to respond to times when we are discouraged. And so we have that statement that, that I said at the beginning. While there are many reasons for discouragement, we just went through them. And there are more. There are many more reasons for hope. There's many more reasons for hope. What are they? What are they? How did he respond to his discouragement. Let's go there. I think I gave you, how many did I give you? Four, four of them that I've picked out in this psalm. First of all, we see in verses one and two, the way that we should respond and the way that the psalmist responds to depression and discouragement is that first of all, he seeks God. He seeks God. Verse 40, verse, chapter 42, verse 1 says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So we see that there's a thirst that he has for God. He doesn't just say, well, I'm dry. And I recognize that life stinks right now. I don't have what I need. No, he's saying, I thirst for God. I know who I need. And only the spiritual man can, can recognize his thirst for God. Only the man who, who, who first has a relationship with God can, can also recognize that he needs him. And so he, he, he's illustrating for us a desperate need for this life-giving water, the living God, the real God, the true God, not the gods of this earth. And it, it kind of reminds me of, of times in my life when, when I've experienced physical uh, thirst and also spiritual thirst. Okay, let me, let me tell you about uh, a physical thirst that I've faced in my life. Have, has anybody ever gone um, hiking like in the mountains before? Anybody ever done that before? Yeah, a few of you. Okay. Now, what's really important when you go hiking in the, in the mountains? You need to know where you're going to get water from, okay? You can survive without food for, you know, quite a while, but you can't survive without water if you're dehydrated, okay? And so when I was in high school, my dad, uh, he, he, in his college days, went to Yosemite National Park and uh, did, did a whole camping slew there, and he always wanted to take us as kids their hiking. And so we did it, I think, three different occasions. But one time it was like an intense seven day trip. We didn't take any tents. We just took packs, bear canisters. Um, we took some water bottles along and one of those water pumps, okay, Th that you can pretty much stick in a, in a dirty, dirty stream and, and come out with pure water, okay, just fresh, good water to drink. So that's what we did. Um, we went out we depended on that we were going to find water along the way. And so we started in the high country. 
uh, because it's easier to walk down than it is to walk up. We did, um, if you're familiar with Yosemite, we did Clouds Rest, we did Half Dome, we did El Capitan and Yosemite Falls. All kind of just did a, did a big loop of the valley. And uh, seven days, in the first couple days, guess what? We, we ran out of water. We, we were desperate for water. We, we didn't find any water along the way. We drank it all. I mean, obviously, you use it for cooking. Everything's dehydrated, so you're, you're using water for a lot of things. And uh, we ran out, and we were thirsty. It was like probably half a day where we were searching for water while trying to hike. I mean, hiking without water is no fun. And uh, we came finally to this stream, just this little trickle of water that, that came across the path. And it was like we, we saw life. <laughs> we were like, we're not going to die. <laughs> and so we, we go and we stick that water purifier in that little stream. And I think we spent two hours trying to get a few water bottles of water out of it. But, but that, that, that for me, you know, made me think of what the psalmist is, is feeling. He's like, I am desperate. I'm going to die without this need being met. This is a necessity. I need you, God. I need you. We just sang those words, didn't we? Oh, God, how I need you. Do we sing them as if we really mean it? That's what the psalmist is doing. I need you, God. I have this desperate need that I can only find met in you, God. So he's seeking God, like we did for water in Yosemite. <laughs> uh, number two, he remembers. He remembers, verse four and verses six through eight. We see this a couple times. We're kind of going to be, be jumping through this psalm a little bit. I'm, I'm trying to follow it in, in, in order, but... Um, verse four, look at verse four. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. Skip to verse six. He says, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and Hermon from Mount Mizar. Okay. So he's feeling distance from God. He says, Jordan and Mizar, he's far away from where the tabernacle is or where the temple is from Jerusalem. And so he's, he's saying, God, I, I remember what you've done in the past. He's not forgetting. He, he's recognizing, God, you did not move. I need you, God. And here's, here's some things that he remembers. First of all, he remembers his promises. And let's apply this to ourselves. When we're discouraged, we've got to remember his promises. His promises. Verse 4, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. He's remembering these things because he's far away from them. He's saying, there have been times where I have celebrated with God and with other people your faithfulness. You, you, your provision, God, to us as a people. And, and aren't holidays meant to do that? Where, where we remember certain times in the history of our nation, where we remember to be thankful. That's what Israel did. In their, in their celebrations, in their festivals, that's what they were doing. They were remembering Passover when, when they were brought out of slavery in Egypt. They're remembering God's faithfulness, his provision, his, his protection. These things he, he was calling to remembrance when he was down. And that's, that's what we need to do as well. When we gather in church, uh, we need to remember that this isn't just singing some songs and listening to someone speak. That's not what we're doing here. That's not the point. That's not the end. What we're doing is we're bringing to remembrance God, his character, and his promises. And when we sing to one another, guess what? We, we're, we're, we're encouraging each other. We're not just singing up. We're singing across, okay? We're telling one another to trust in God. And when we preach, we're, we're reminding ourselves of the faithfulness of God in everything that he's done. And so don't, don't underestimate corporate worship. Some people are moving to like online worship where they sit in their living room and they watch a pastor preach for an hour and then they call that church. Um, you may have watched a church service, but you did not experience church. Church is when we come together as a community. And we're reminding ourselves 
And we're coming together and we're, we're strengthening our hand in God, in his promises, in his character. So don't underestimate church. When I've been away from church, uh, say if we're traveling on vacation and, and we didn't make it on a Sunday morning, guess what? I kind of feel dry, don't you? You feel like you missed something. We need to be around his people. We need to be remembering that. Okay? So don't underestimate God's gift to us in church, in the community, in praising together as, as David is, is rec- it's not David, it's the psalmist that, that he's recognizing here, okay? One of the sons of Korah. Second thing that he remembers is this, not only his promises, but his provision, his provision, okay? He says this in verse 7, deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls, he goes on, all your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Okay, let's, let's take the second part of that statement. It's in verse 7. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Notice who brought them. Who brought the, the trials? Who brought the waves? Who brought the waterfalls? Who, who, who brought the, the breakers? Who's, who's smashing him up against the seashore? Who does it say? You. You did. All of your breakers and your waves crashed down on me. God, you did this? You brought me here? Yeah, he did. Yes, he did. And we remember from last week uh, that, that all of God's paths are paths of righteousness for those that love him, right? Do you believe that the painful trials you're going through is a path of for righteousness for you? Are you considering it pure joy whenever you go through trials? That's what James says. That's what the psalmist is expressing. God, you didn't leave me. You brought me here for a purpose. Because you brought me here, I know you'll sustain me through it. I know you have a plan for it, a good plan. And so he says at the beginning of verse 7, deep calls to deep. I don't exactly know what that means, but what I, what I get from it is that the deepest part of God is reaching to the deepest part of me. He's, he's reaching out to me in ways that he only can. And he's strengthening and sustaining me when he's brought me to times of discouragement. He's got a purpose. Sometimes that purpose is just get me to trust him. Get me to strengthen my hand in him. He's got a purpose for everything that we go through. So he remembers his promises. He remembers his provision. Third, he remembers his presence, his presence. That's in verse 8. If you skip down there, it says, By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and by night his song is with me, a prayer to God for my life. So day and night, he's steadfast. He's with me. His song is with me. We need to remind ourselves of the steadfast presence of God, that he's faithful wherever we go, okay? When we are discouraged, this is a reason for our hope. God's presence, he is with us. Fourth, he remembers his power. That's under D. He remembers his promises, provision, presence, and his power, he says, I say to God, my rock, my rock. We'll stop there. We're going to get to the next verses in a little bit. He refers to God as his rock, his security, his stronghold, And so he's communicating his trust and his dependence on God through times that are difficult, through unresolved times of pain, where he doesn't know where the end is going to bring him. He's saying, God, you're my rock. You're my rock. Some of us refer to family members that way. Like my mom was my rock, you know, through through when my dad died. You know, we need to think about God in that way, that he's our rock. He's our fortress. He's our cornerstone. So while there are some reasons for discouragement, these are some reasons for hope. There are reasons for hope. And, and, and we're going to keep on, keep on going, but we need to remember, when we're going through times of depression and discouragement, his presence, his provision, his power, his promises. Let's remember those things. What's another way that, that he responds? So he, he remembers... He is uh, reminding himself of, of uh, seeking God, that, that he, he's, he's seeking after him. Third, he asks why. He asks why. Why, God? Why? It's not wrong to ask why. And, and here we come to like the refrain of the psalm. If, if we sing a chorus when we're singing like a worship song, this is like the chorus of the psalm, okay? It's like that, that line that you repeat a few different times. And, and we see it repeated here in verse 5. 
And then we also see it repeated in verse 11, okay? Verses 5, uh, the, all of 5 and a little bit of verse 6 repeated twice, okay? And then you'll see, if you want to keep on reading into Psalm 43, you'll see it repeated again, okay? Three times he says this line. It's like the refrain to the song, but it's a question. He first asks why. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? So that's the, that's the first question he asked. Two questions there. Why are you cast down? Why are you in tur- turmoil? Why am I in turmoil over this? Verse 9, he asks more questions. If you, if you glance over there, he says, he asks, Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. Okay, so, so here what we see is, is when we're going through discouragement and depression, we've got to ask that question, why? Just like the psalmist did. Why are we down? Why are we down? And we need, to, we need to give ourselves permission to just pause and check our heart and ask these challenging questions to our soul. Now, you'll notice he didn't say, my soul is cast down and that's just the way it's going to be. I'm going to just stay there. I'm going to be down in the dumps. I'm going to be depressed. And there's nothing that I can do about it. He didn't say that. Okay, some of us have that tendency to just, just give in. But we've got to ask that question, why? We've got to demand for ourselves a reason to explain why we should be depressed. Why we should be discouraged. Because I think what you're going to see is that, yes, you have valid reasons to be discouraged, but you have many more reasons for what? Hope. Many more reasons for hope. Okay, his reasons for discouragement was, was that he was desperate. He was facing, feeling distance from God. He was depressed. He, he was being derided by those that were close to him. He was being cut down. But they were not enough reasons when compared to his reasons for hope. So he preaches to himself. He asks himself why, and then he goes and preaches to himself. Okay, sometimes we need a little preacher in our head. Okay, not me. You need yourself to preach to yourself. Okay, okay. Verse 5, keep on reading. It's the second part of verse 5. <laughs> yeah, I love this. He says, hope in God. Hope in God, self. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So his soul had been depressing him, had been crushing him. He stands up and says, no more. Self, listen for a moment. You've got reason for hope. Hope in God. God. I used to have a high school teacher who used to talk to himself all the time. Um, he, he, he would always say this statement when he was telling us a story about his thought processes. Uh, his name was Mr. Olson. He was an art teacher. And whenever he, he would tell us a story when he was making the decision, he would say, so I said to myself, self, da 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 da. You know? And we always laughed at him. We thought it was just silly. Okay, But this is what the psalmist is doing. Okay, He's saying, so I said to myself, self, Okay, do you realize that most of the times that when we are down in the dumps, discouraged and depressed, it's because we are listening to ourselves more than we are talking to ourselves, that we are listening to ourselves more than we're preaching to ourselves? It's true. We get up in the morning and someone starts talking to us, starts cutting us down, starts bringing up things from yesterday. Who's that? Ourself. And we need to combat that with speaking, preaching to ourself the truth. Okay? If, if there's anything that you need to take away, it's that today. Okay? You need to preach to yourself the reasons you have for hope and stop living in the dumps. Stop, stop considering what you're going through to, to just be the, the end of your life. It's not. It's not. I don't care what you're going through. Okay, we've all been through a lot. It's not. We've got many more reasons for hope. Look at what he says is his greatest reason for hope. Verse 5, end of verse 5. He says, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. You know what his reason for hope was? It was in God, who was his salvation. 
Who is his salvation? Okay, this was, this was someone who had not seen the reality of Jesus Christ, who had come down to this earth, who had lived a sinless life, died a sinner's death, and resurrected from the dead, taking the punishment that we deserve for our sins. Okay, he had not seen that reality, but was looking forward to that in hope. Okay, we've been through it. We see Christ. We know him. We have reasons for hope because he says, believe in me and you'll be saved. We have an eternity that we have a hope in because of Christ Jesus. Our faith has been made sight in that way. Of course, he's still to come, still to be made sight in that way. But his reason for hope was that he's looking forward to a savior and we have that savior, his salvation, his God. We have a God who loves us, who cares for us. So he preaches to himself, and I believe we need to do the same thing. And the best way to preach to yourself is using scripture, okay? Maybe we need to say something like, like it says in Romans 8, where it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave, us, gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. Do we believe that? Do we preach that to ourselves when we're discouraged? God, you have plans for good. You've given me your son. You, you have an eternity that, that, that is coming. I, I need to live my life not thinking about this temporal world, but thinking about God, what is your plan in, in eternity for me? This wor world is going to be hard. We are going to be discouraged, and, and it's not eliminating that. Just saying, even when we're discouraged, we've got a reason to hope. Got something to look forward to. It's eternity with God. Romans 8 goes on to say this, and, and I want to just read it as, as we kind of wrap up. Who shall separate us? Preach this to yourself. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us first. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, think about that, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Preach that to yourself. Preach it to yourself. You need it. You need it when you're depressed. So while there are reasons for discouragement, there are many more reasons for hope. Ask yourself this. I want you to just ask yourself as we close. Maybe close your eyes. Think about it in your heart. Where's your hope? Where is your hope today? Is it on what you have? The stuff that you got? Your job? Your kids? Your family? I mean, those things can be torn away from you in a second, in a phone call. I got a phone call on, what was it, last Thursday morning. Early morning phone calls are never good, right? It was about my grandpa, right? Okay. Yeah, he's like a rock in our family. But guess what? We got reasons for hope, even, even if things go really, really south, which they're not doing that great, you know? That, that's just, that's minimal for me. You know, for, to what a lot of you guys are going through, I know. But we got reasons for hope. Hope in God. Preach that to yourself. And, and this too, if, if, if you're feeling at this point, like, I don't, I don't even know God. You need a relationship with him. Maybe you didn't, didn't even realize that this was why you're you feeling like life is so, so pointless, or why life is not satisfying. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. Reach out to him in faith. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in your death, your resurrection. I believe that, that you came to pay the price for my sin. I know I'm a sinner, Lord Jesus. I admit that to you. I confess my sin. I, I trust you, Lord Jesus. I want, I want you to be my Savior and my God. I want to be a part of your family. Would you do that today? And let's, let's make it a point in this week and in the years and days to come to delight in God to give him our hope, especially when we're going through difficult times.